Hello and welcome to this workshop, Free Software Tools for the Classroom. Today we're going to be covering a number of software tools which you may find very useful either for your teaching or your research, collaborating with other uh, researchers here on campus, or that you may offer to your students as uh, useful for classroom activities or their own professional lives. I am Peter Gowen. I'm the online coordinator here in faculty development. Uh, I aid with Blackboard support and general questions around using technology to be more effective in the classroom. Uh, please do feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the tools we've covered today or especially on anything to do with uh, Blackboard or Blackboard Collaborate as we're using to record and deliver these sessions online. Today I'll be covering a number of tools and I wanted to categorize them and call out a certain uh, feature set for each one. I've added badges to all of the uh, different tools we have today, so I'd like to explain what these different badges mean. Some of the tools we will cover are what's known as freemium. All of the tools that we will cover are absolutely free, but sometimes you can pay for more advanced features, as I'll mention uh, when we get to any of those. A lot of the apps that we'll cover today are not only uh, on the desktop, but also you're able to them with mobile apps. So it's you're able to do things both from your or your laptop and your phone or your tablet, which can be very useful if you have one particular device in front of you at that time. A lot of the tools are, are also web-based, which for this purpose means all you need is just to be able to get on the internet. You can open up your favorite web browser, whether that's Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer, or if you're on the Mac, Safari and you'll be able to use the tool right in the web browser right there, which makes it very convenient. A couple of the tools I'll mention are also open source. Uh, for some, this is a very um, agreeable kind of philosophy or ideology around software tools and software use. Open source projects are completely open for the community to build, so anyone who wants to can contribute to that particular tool. Some like to be able to uh, hack their own software and play around with it. Any tools we cover today that are open source are robust, are safe and secure. They've been reviewed. They've been out in the community for a long time, so you don't have to worry about spam or anything like that. And last but not least, any app that has a uh, desktop version that's available to download and install to get all of the features available, I will call out with this download badge. OK, so let's get started and cover some interesting software tools. First up is Office 365. So, show of hands, if you would go ahead and raise your hand, who all has heard of Office 365 before? Good, quite a few people have. Excellent. Well, we have had Office 365 available to us for a couple of years now as faculty and staff or teaching assistants, but very soon, uh, students will also be enrolled in the full Office 365 suite. They currently have access to a lot of these tools, but not all of the features. And come about mid-August before classes start, all of that should become available to them. That opens up a few extra opportunities, which I'll cover. So here is the Office 365 portal page. It is fully online. Most of the apps available do have mobile versions, as well as downloadable versions for your PC or your Macintosh. You'll notice as soon as I log into Office 365 here, there are all of these different tiles. These are the different apps available, from Mail and Calendar to OneDrive, which I'll cover later on, as well as the main Microsoft Office suite. So things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote I'll mention as well, but a few other more advanced tools and if you don't want to always do things from the web, if you actually have a full desktop computer or a laptop, you can actually install the vast majority of these apps directly to your computer. So that way you can stay signed in to them regularly, which can be very handy. So some of the features available in Office 365, you'll notice that it is the main Microsoft Office suite. This is available to everyone already. You can get access to Word, PowerPoint, Excel. You can download them up to five different devices, 
and they're available basically everywhere. This makes it very convenient to use the same tools here on campus. So everyone can uh, use Word, they can create Word files. If you're asking for research documents, you know, you want a research paper from your class, you don't have to worry about them not having money to be able to afford some of these basic office tools, which is very nice. Very soon, once uh, students are also in the full version of Office 365, it'll also be very easy to share and collaborate uh, with them too. Currently, we're all able to go into any of these tools and easily search for anyone in the system and share things with them, which makes it very convenient if I want to work on a uh, research document with my colleague Tracy, who's joined us here today. I can create a Word document within the online version of Office 365 and easily share that with her, and then we can actually work on it at the same time. If anyone's used uh, Google Docs before, it's a lot like that. It's very convenient. And that is available uh, directly at o, not zero, but o365.niu.edu. As I mentioned, uh, everyone has available uh, up to five devices. You can install it on any of the things you might have. I can't imagine anyone having more than that. I mean, that already covers if you had one desktop computer, a laptop. Maybe you have one that you keep at home and one at work, a phone, a tablet. It would really be up to uh, tech junkies to have way more than that. So that should cover just about everyone really well. And as I mentioned, student accounts, uh, they will move. Currently, they're on Google. They will move to Microsoft uh, on August 11th, hopefully. That is the date. We were planning on rolling that out earlier in the semester, so some people may have noticed uh, announcements coming down back in uh, late spring semester. Unfortunately, it didn't happen then, but now they're planning on having it rolled out by August, which will be before classes. Makes that very convenient. One of the uh, Office 65 apps that I want to call out very specifically here today is OneDrive. Has everyone used something like Dropbox or Google Drive before? Feel free to raise your hand again. Excellent. Yeah, so it looks like uh, most people here have used some kind of cloud-based storage system. Well, we have here available at NIU automatically to everyone OneDrive that works just like all the rest of those others that I mentioned. So here you can see an interface for OneDrive. I logged in online, so you'll notice that it's fully web-based. And here I actually opened a Word document within OneDrive. So I opened OneDrive and actually found all my different documents, my files that I had there. And here I've opened it up. This is not the full version of Word, which you could download if you wanted to. But you'll notice that it has most of those basic features I wanted including up here a share button. Once I click the share button, then I could just type in Stephanie Richter, who also works here at Faculty Development, and then I can quickly and easily share this document with her. Not only sharing it with her, but then we could work on it at the exact same time as I mentioned. If you want to, you can also get a link and then share it with someone off campus, but for the most part, it's designed to be able to share with your colleagues here on campus or for students to be able to share with each other if they're working on some kind of group project, something like that. OneDrive is available for download as well. So if you're familiar with Dropbox, which I'll also mention, uh, you're able to sync all of your files directly to one of your computers which is very convenient if you want to keep extra copies everywhere else. David has a question. How does the security of OneDrive compare to our unit shared drives we currently use? It is just as secure. It, it has passed uh, FERPA and HIPAA compliance. Of course, it's only as secure as users, me or you, make it. So if I'm on my computer and I download my files and I do something else on my computer, and my computer gets infected, any files that I downloaded to the computer might be open to anyone else. Otherwise, OneDrive itself is very secure. It meets all the basic federal standards. It's a good question. Yeah, it's something that people are definitely concerned about as we're touching a lot of student data. We may have sensitive data for our own research available as well. So it's not something that we have to worry about. Other features of OneDrive, basic feature is just that you're able to save any files that you might have to the cloud. So it's a good way to back things up. But then once you've put them in OneDrive, you have access 
to them from any of your other computers or from your laptop or your tablet or your smartphone if you either log in online or if you download one of the dedicated OneDrive apps to those devices. The really nifty feature of OneDrive though is that once you have any files in there, if they're Office apps, they kind of are glued together across campus. So you're very easily able to use OneDrive to share it with anyone else that you might want to share it with. Again, makes it very convenient to quickly open up collaboration, those kinds of things. Since it's available to any of the Office suite, it does mean that we're able to work on Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, Excel spreadsheets, any of those kind of basic Office documents. And it does offer, as I mentioned, real-time collaboration too, which is very nice if I'm trying to work on a research paper with someone. Jennifer asks, do you know if there's a data limit for OneDrive when backing up files? There is, and I'm trying to remember, I believe it's either, oh gosh, um, I think it might be one terabyte, but I can't remember for certain. It might not be that high. That sounds like a lot of space. But then again, people tend to save things like um, video files or large uh, multimedia files too to this. So I'll definitely find that out and let you know in a follow-up email because uh, that is a very important question. For things like Word documents or if you just have a few pictures that you're backing up, no problem whatsoever. It would only be if you're keeping very large data sets or things like movie presentations if you're in some kind of multimedia or video class. A couple of uses uh, to think about. I've already mentioned co-authoring research. Uh, very useful if you're working with someone else here on campus. You can quickly find them and add them to a project. And student group projects. I mean, this is probably what OneDrive is more or less built for here on campus. Students now have access to be able to share things very easily with each other. Whereas they could share files between each other through email, this keeps everything in sync. They don't have to worry about managing multiple versions of it. Very convenient. And uh, as with all the different Office products, this is available again, logging into the web at 0365.niu.edu or searching the app stores, either on Android or iPhone or iPad uh, for OneDrive. You'll be able to find the main apps there. Since I talked about cloud storage a little bit and I already mentioned Dropbox, I wanted to cover it a little bit more in detail. This is my own personal favorite. Whereas OneDrive is very, very good for storing files for people who are working on things on campus, uh, I actually pay for Dropbox myself because I like a lot of storage. So I actually pay for some extra storage. So Dropbox is a freemium app. It is free and available to anyone who wants it, but you can pay for extra benefits like larger storage. There are mobile apps. You can log in online just like you can with Office 365 and OneDrive. And you can even download it to your computer so you can keep all of your files across all your computers as well. So I, I tend to keep all of my work files in OneDrive where I can collaborate with other people here in faculty development and then my own personal files in Dropbox. Kind of keep them separate. Very, uh, very handy and convenient for me, especially since I have a lot of pictures that I've taken. Extra features that are included with it. Again, you can save files in the cloud. I find Dropbox to be a little bit easier than OneDrive. But all the same features are available for both, including sharing folders or files with different people. Dropbox, of course, since it doesn't know about NIU, wouldn't be able to easily share with other people at NIU, but all you need is an email to be able to work, open that up. And again, backuping, backing up and syncing uh, non-work-related files, this is perfect for. Dropbox is available at dropbox.com. You can find uh, apps on the app stores as well. Any questions about any of the apps I've covered so far? You know, people have already had a few, and this is good. Now, I want to make sure to answer any of the questions everyone has. No other questions? I'll go ahead and move on to a couple of note-taking apps. OneNote is another of the Office 365 apps available for everyone here on campus. It's a very good and robust note-taking app. You'll notice that you can also log into o365.com and be able to use it online. Here I've actually logged in and I'm showing the online interface. It's a little bit simpler than the full one that I would have if I installed it on my desktop or my laptop, but it uh, gives me most of the basic features here available to me. You'll notice it's very good for uh, compiling notes. 
Here I can click on a notebooks button to access multiple different notebooks. So maybe I'll keep one for each class or for different um, departments or projects I'm working on across campus. I can then add different sections for each one. So if I want to add research references in one place and then a draft of a document in another, something like that. And then I can even have subsections as well. So I can very easily manage any kind of complex note-taking structure that I might want if I want to get that complex. Otherwise, you'll notice here I can add some notes. I've got a box of notes off to a side. I can add a picture. So it's very robust. It allows me to take very detailed multimedia notes. A couple of other features, since you do have it in Office 365, or if you install it or your Mac, as long as you log in, you'll be able to sync those and access them from anywhere you get an internet connection across any of your devices. Very handy. One of the other really key features to OneNote specifically is the ability to add Office files, like a PowerPoint document, to the actual note itself. If you embed any uh, Word or Excel or PowerPoint document into the note, you're then actually able to edit it within OneNote. So it actually pulls it up in OneDrive. You can edit it there. And then when you save it, it'll keep that saved copy within OneNote. This sounds extra fancy. People might wonder, why would you want to do something like that? It's actually kind of uh, very neat to work with if you're a student and you've gotten your lecture notes from uh, your lecture PowerPoint slides from your professor. You can then save a copy to your OneNote and take uh, notes, add annotations, mark it up, maybe in callouts or circle things on the slides themselves and then save down any of those annotations within OneNote. So it keeps everything compiled in one place. Again, as with anything in Office 365, you can share notebooks with other people. So not only can you take notes in your own meetings, which I've used a lot before, or classes, and actually OneNote was, at the time, when I was doing my graduate studies, uh, my favorite uh, note-taking app. But you can also share them. So this could be shared field notes if you're uh, maybe someone's out doing some field research and you want to share uh, over the internet with other people. They can get access to those there and begin working on research paper with you. Or class notes for studying. So if I'm in a class, maybe I want to share notes with other uh, people in my cohorts that we have access to those before the midterm or the final. And again, since it is built into Office 365, it's also available at o365.niu.edu. As I mentioned, there are mobile apps available as well. And Beheshte says, OneNote is very cool. Yes. Since you've used it before, uh, what are your favorite features in there? What have you used it for? If you don't mind me putting you on the spot anyway. Give you just a minute to respond here. Otherwise, any other questions about OneNote itself? Any of its features, uh, note taking in it? Again, it is secure. Everything is saved in OneDrive, so you don't have to worry about anyone that you don't want getting access to it actually accessing it. OK. David says, we used it for a brainstorming session, allowing everyone to chime in when they had time to participate over a span of two days. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Any of those kind of collaborative note-taking ideas, it's very useful. Since again, everyone has access to it. But Heshte, usually in my classes as a student, use it for note-taking. Yeah, I loved it for that. For me, my favorite part was I can quickly open up a note and put in a bulleted list and quickly add, like here, bullets and sub-bullets, as well as copying and pasting notes from uh, reference articles, too. The next note-taking app I want to mention is my current favorite. This is Evernote. Again, as with Dropbox, it's not automatically aware of everyone at NIU, but I like some of its uh, more advanced features. Another participant asks, if you leave NIU, will you still have access to your O365, especially since you need to use your NI credential, NI, NIU credentials to sign in? I don't believe you do automatically, but you should be able to download copies of everything at the very least. That's a good question, though. Since everything is saved to an NIU account, you wouldn't automatically have access to it. Typically, access to uh, NIU services lasts for a period of time after you leave. 
so you don't have to worry about having access cut off immediately, but that is something to think about. Now, if you do leave NIU, you may want to make backups of things. Since everything would be, in, would be saved in OneDrive, you can easily export a uh, large dump of everything. If you have a ton of really big files, it might take a while, of course, but otherwise, that's a very good question. So Evernote is another note-taking app. It has a few more advanced features, which I try to take advantage of uh, myself to help me manage uh, some more complex kinds of notes. This is a freemium app, so it is freely available to everyone. For the basic note-taking features, like creating notes in notebooks here, that is available to everyone that you might want. A more advanced feature would be um, saving recipes from the web. That's not just copy and paste. You're given access to things like uh, web clipping or presenting on the go if you want to pay for those more advanced features or more storage. Otherwise, it's freely available as a mobile app or just log in online, and you can also download a full copy to your computer. I have it installed on pretty much every computer I have, including my own uh, tablet and phone. I find it very useful to access notes here. So some of its features that kind of stand out from uh, OneNote one of my favorite is the ability to clip whole articles from a website. This allows me to save all of the content, all of the styling, any of the pictures that were on the page, and then save it to my Evernote. Once I have it in there, then, I can tag it. I can add a little description to it, and then any other related article I can add the same tag to, and then later on, if I want to search my notes for any related content, all I have to do is just search for that tag or that short description. Even more advanced would be certain automa automation features. So I already mentioned clipping, which you just need to install a little plugin in your browser. Uh, there are other features that allow you to automatically, once you create a clip article, uh, massage it in different ways, create notes from it, or create a, um, an electronic business card, things of that nature. Very useful if you want to take the time to learn a little bit more of a more complex but robust uh, featured tool. Again, taking notes in class or meetings, very useful. And you do have sharing abilities. Again, it's not automatically aware of everyone here at NIU, like one be, but all you need is another uh, email address for someone you want to share it with, very easy and quick. And if you want to access that, Evernote.com, or again, since it's available as a mobile app, you can just search the app stores for it. Moving on to a few other things you might want to do uh, or have your uh, students do in yours, different kinds of multimedia, uh, multimedia capabilities. So photo manipulation is something that we all do occasionally. Uh, sometimes we'll take a picture of ourselves at a conference or we'll take a picture of some place we visited that's relevant to our class. Uh, Photoshop Express is one good app that allows that's free and allows anyone to do some quick Manipulation. Ellie asks, could you please tell, show us more about the advanced features of Evernote that you use? Unfortunately, I'm not able to show them, but I can absolutely uh, explain some of them. So for me, Evernote, um, let me back up to that slide here and show, oops, one too far. So you'll notice that I have access to a number of different notes. And here, this is just a promotional image showing what you can do. But you'll notice that you have multiple notebooks these notebooks can have sub-notebooks in them, and then each one has a collection of notes. For those, I can then add multiple tags, tag them as, I guess, just kind of generically cool, or maybe food if I'm creating recipes. And then when I want to, all I need to do is just go up and search. For instance, if I want to search for any of my recipes that might be found in my different notebooks, if I've tagged them with food, those will show up automatically so I can quickly get access to all of those. But you can extend this any other way you want. People get kind of crazy with tags sometimes. So you can have a uh, main description, uh, use a word like food here, and then separate it with a colon, and then have... Uh, sauces or something like that. So you can then search food colon sauces for any of the uh, sauces in any of your recipes, things of that nature. Uh, other automation tasks, 
I haven't even gotten into because they're so, they can be uh, interesting, but a little bit more complex. If you're familiar with a service called If This Then That, that allows you to, for instance, um, automatically email yourself if you add a new note or send a, or add a note to Evernote if you send an email to a particular address. Crazy automation things of that nature, but very, very robust. It allows you to do a lot of different um, things if you want to search for any of those kind of procedural uh, uh, task-oriented kinds of automations. So multimedia, getting into uh, some photo manipulation. Photoshop Express, Photoshop actually has a free version. It is available on the web, it is available on Android and iPhone and iPad as well. It gives you access to a few basic features for uh, changing photos, either cropping them, making them a little bit smaller, or calling out particular areas in there, or adjusting things like exposure if you want to make them brighter or darker or want to call attention to a particular thing on the image. Very useful if, again, you're kind of taking photos to, of a conference you've been to, if uh, you meet a scholar that you're talking about in class. Uh, it can be kind of cool to, again, connect your students to the real world. Uh, or if you've assigned them some kind of project where they have to go out and they have to take uh, photos, perhaps it's a scavenger hunt. Maybe you're teaching an ornithology class and you do a bird of the week where everyone takes a uh, picture of a bird that they've found that week, something of that nature. It's always good to have these um, multimedia pocket whenever we need them. Something most of us may not use all that often, but it's good to be aware of. So Photoshop Express, again, very simple photo editing from anywhere cropping, adjusting pictures, and accessible from a lot of different places. If I'm on my desktop, I can just open a web browser and go to photoshop.com, or I can install a free version on my iPhone or my Android phone if I want to. Uh, very simple just to quickly take a photo and touch it up a little bit, very useful. Another one, uh, if you're not into Photoshop, is Pixlr. Pixlr is very similar to Photoshop. It has a few other features. Uh, here you'll notice that it's a slightly more complex interface, but you get a lot of those features that you'd see in, for instance, a full version of Photoshop. So I can uh, erase things, or I can add gradients to things. I can make callouts by adding boxes over stuff. Uh, I can, if I want to, add multiple pictures and edit multiple pictures at the same time on top of each other. And again, this is available from the web or from a phone or a tablet. So very useful. It's amazing what you can find these days that's free. Again, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but if you have more sophisticated needs or if you're doing a little, something a little bit more advanced or asking your students to do something a little bit more advanced, very good app to have handy. Uh, it is freemium as well, so if you want, you can open an account and pay for a little bit of uh, cloud storage too, so you can have those available to you anywhere you want and be able to edit them from the web or from any of your devices very easily within Pixlr's own apps. That's available at pixlr.com. Another option, if you're looking for something that's um, highly recommended by the community, it is mobile only, so I didn't add it as one of the main two that I wanted to feature, but VSCO, often pronounced Visco Cam, is a mobile only solution and it's um, actually one of the most highly touted on the go kind of touch up programs out there. Um, it's very highly recommended by a lot of the main camera blogs that I've seen. A lot of the big uh, bloggers I follow, it's their go to app. But again, it's only available on mobile. Since we're talking about multimedia, I also wanted to mention not only image manipulation, but audio manipulation as well. And for that, we have Audacity. Audacity is an open source project, so it's available for everyone on the web to download and install. And if you want, if you want to learn some programming and add some more features to it, you can actually create your own features within it. There is a very robust community for Audacity itself. This is uh, well known amongst the educational community for recording on and editing audio, and they've created a lot of different plugins and extra tools. So if you want to do something with audio, often you can find an extra tool that you can install into it. It is a very safe and secure program. It's been around for years. Uh, a lot of people with the best of intentions have contributed to it. Highly recommend it. 
It is available to download on PC or Mac only. It's not a mobile uh, app, but that's fine for most of the more advanced things that we want to do with audio. Uh, it's usually a little bit easier to do them from a desktop or a laptop. Its features, uh, you can again record audio, do basic audio editing. You'll be able to see here, ah, Bill Goldenberg says, Audacity is great. Musician and use it often. Hey, that's high praise. That's good to know that you know the professionals here actually use these kinds of tools. Yeah, Bill, if you don't mind talking about it a little bit, uh, how have you used this before? I'm curious. A couple of the uses that I've called out here, though, uh, audio explanation or tutorials. So pictures are great. Audio sometimes. If, you're, if a student has a question and you want to respond via email, maybe it's just easier to record a small snippet of you explaining how to do something or explaining where to find something. So if you ever wanted to record a little bit of audio and then just quickly send that to them, or better yet, post it in Blackboard. Maybe some of your other students would have the same question. Now they get uh, access to that explanation as well. Uh, also, narration for presentations. If you have a slide deck, you could actually narrate those and add that narration to the slide deck. Bill says, uses it to edit clips as samples for getting preliminary auditions, jobs, etc. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. Any kind of um, piece that you might want to put in your own portfolio. Maybe record uh, some of your own audio, whether that's a speaking piece or, in Bill's case, a musical number, uh, having those available and being able to post them. It's good to know about these kinds of tools for people who have those uses. And that's available at audacity.sourceforge.net. SourceForge is one of the largest online repositories of open source software. Again, very highly recommended. Comes with a gold star recommendation from someone here on campus, too. Other options for uh, mobile, there are always a number of different mobile uh, apps available to you. Most phones come with some kind of voice recorder. Uh, typically, they'll be called one or those other things. Audio Memos Free is another thing that I've used before. It's a free app. It's available on iOS only, but you'll be able to find uh, similar things if you have an Android phone. You can quickly create uh, basic .wav files, which are read by every different kind of uh, audio device on the planet. And you can be transferred to your computer. For instance, you could download it to your computer and then edit it in Audacity. If you wanted to get a little more fancy, though, and not just record some voice, but to record yourself doing something as well as narrating, Jing is a really good um, opportunity to check out some kind of tool. Ellie asks, will these PowerPoints be available after the webinar? Absolutely. I'll send them to everyone uh, when I follow up with an email later on. Yeah, I know I'm covering a ton of different material here today very quickly. So if you want to get access to those to be able to review later, not only will I post a recording of an archive of this session, but I'll send those PowerPoint to you as well. So Jing is a uh, tutorial creator, very useful. Here you'll notice that I, I'm recording a tutorial on how to use Audacity. So you see up at the top this little sunburst. When I click the sunburst, it opens up. I can take a screenshot or I can record a tutorial. And here I've decided I'm going to record a tutorial of this particular app. And I have basic recording uh, tools available to me. I can start and stop a recording. I can take a screenshot. Or I can even actually add some of my own annotations uh, to the uh, screen itself right here. Very useful for if I'm explaining some kind of tool to someone. So if later on you have a question about using Audacity or any of the other apps available today, maybe if it's a little bit more complex, I'll record a Jing tutorial for you. So I can actually open up the app itself, open up Jing, and tell Jing, look at this particular app. And then I'll start the recording, and then I'll talk about how to use the app. And as I'm going through it, you'll actually see me moving my mouse and clicking on things and everything happening in the app. Very useful if you want to demonstrate stuff to your students. It is free if you want to output a basic Flash video. Flash is still useful across the web. Uh, if you do want access to different kinds of video formats, though, you will um, have to pay for an account. But for free, you do get Flash out of the box. 
Again, you can capture what's on your screen either as video or as a single screenshot. So it's really easy to take uh, screen captures right there on your computer without having to hit the print screen key and then open up Photoshop, things like that. You can record a tutorial. Uh, for the free version, it is only up to five minutes. So these are supposed to be used just for short tutorials, but uh, very useful. One of the limiting features for Jing, however, is it does not automatically caption your tutorials. So if it is something that you're posting uh, in your own course, as course materials, I would recommend adding a transcript for your students, just in case there's anyone hearing impaired or visually impaired. It gives them a little bit of extra uh, multiple modes of being able to engage with your content. There are privacy options available as well. By default, any videos you create, if you're sharing them with other people, are automatically publicly available. But if you do want to create an account on screencast.com, then you can uh, keep those a little bit more private. You can get a link to share with people, and only those people with the link would be able to view it. Again, uses, uh, troubleshooting, another thing that's very useful for Jing. So if someone asks me about a Blackboard question, I might actually create a tutorial quickly if I want to explain something a little bit more complex, or just demonstrate new concepts or tools. Perhaps you want to create a short tutorial on how to do research on the web. So you might show your students how to use uh, Google Scholar or how to use JSTOR to find relevant articles for their research project. Jing is available at techsmith.com slash Jing. Uh, you'll be able to find and download it there. It's a very small application that you can install on your own computer and very useful if you're creating tutorials for other people. Since I talked about a uh, PC or Mac tool, I also wanted to recommend one that's available on mobile, and that's this Lenzu Create. Lenzu is an app that allows you to create Khan Academy style videos. Is everyone here familiar with Khan Academy? If you wouldn't mind raising your hand if you are. Okay, I've got only one, excellent. So let me explain Khan Academy a little bit. Two, excellent, okay. Khan Academy is a website you can go to learn things about mathematics, science, uh, health. It is a series of video tutorials on different concepts where the author has created a uh, basically a slide deck where they come in, they have a number of different slides, like here one of my slides I might have, and then I can talk about these concepts narrating and over my slides at the same time. So here, in this particular example, I'm showing off how to balance a chemical equation to show a chemical reaction. So I'd actually be going through, here's what's happening at the beginning and the middle and the end in this different reaction, and showing how these different uh, chemicals interact with each other and what happens over time. So I would actually create this slide first off by adding my text here and then starting my and then drawing on the slides and talking about what's happening. Lenzu Create does the same thing for you from mobile. Very handy. You can actually create handwritten narrated tutorials. You can write on the slides and set them up. You can sketch on them while you're talking about them. You can annotate on whatever you want. So you can actually import photos or PDFs. And then you can upload to their cloud storage. Uh, very limited, though you can buy extra storage if you find that this is a very useful tool for you. Again, providing like small lectures for your students, since these are video clips, typically we want to keep them relatively short so we don't lose our students, uh, but very useful for those kinds of short tutorials. Um, demonstrating some kind of problem solving or, for instance, um, since we're talking about music, maybe instead of chemical equations, we'd actually have musical staff. So maybe you could talk about composing a piece, or maybe musical theory, something of that nature. Or if you're in athletics, maybe this is um, a diagram of a soccer or a football field, and you're talking about running plays. You can actually set it up so you have all of your players lined up on the line of scrimmage, and then you uh, annotate and talk about how the play is supposed to go from beginning to end. So very useful and pretty fun, too. Other options. Um, since this one is just one of the many out there, I want to talk about a few others. Screener and Screencast-O-Matic are another couple that are available uh, from the web or from mobile. 
Show me and Edu Creations are a couple of iPad only, but they're very similar to Lenzu. Uh, most of these are right now kind of competing with everyone else. So uh, you'll notice that most of the features are very similar, but there may be ones that you just like their particular features or style of a little bit more than others. So a ton of options available out there, a ton of things free. Talking about presentations in general, though, another alternative to uh, PowerPoint. Sometimes people are looking for something that's not just the same standard PowerPoint slide deck. So one thing I wanted to mention is Prezi. Has everyone seen Prezi before? I know Prezi is pretty popular amongst um, the education crowd. It isn't always uh, known outside of education, however. And a few hands raised, so yeah, a few people know about Prezi. Prezi uh, gets away from the standard slide deck metaphor and instead creates a canvas. Here you'll notice this is actually an entire presentation on tools for blended learning around a few different concepts. You'll notice, so instead of having a slide deck where I have my slides grouped by, uh, for this particular presentation, content content delivery, communication, assessment tools. I actually create areas on the map. So I've got my main area here, which I've labeled, and then these sub areas, which I've labeled as well. And then you'll notice within those areas, they actually have what seem to be their own slides embedded within them. What happens is as I run through my presentation, it will actually zoom into each of these areas and then zoom into any of the other ones within them. I actually create animations and transitions between all of these. So it keeps the presentation a little bit more dynamic. Instead of just a slide with a picture and some text on it, I'm actually uh, zooming and panning between different areas on here. It can be kind of fun, a little bit more engaging for your students. It might be a little bit more work. Again, it's kind of hoping that it'll be a little bit more engaging. You'll get them a little more interested in the content that you're showing. So again, it does away with that slide deck meta. Instead, you use a broad canvas that you paint your presentation on. You can create presentations on the web. So all you need is just a web browser, some kind of internet connected device. And there are uh, apps available on the iPad or iPhone, uh, but they are used only to present or to view presentations created from Prezi. There are collaboration and sharing features as well. So if you want to create a presentation with someone else, you can give them access to it. Again, just a general alternative to PowerPoint. Uh, Larissa, did you have a question? No, okay, yeah. Prezi is fun, I've used it before. <laughs> no, sorry, that's perfectly fine. Uh, Jennifer says, you can import PowerPoint presentations in Prezi. You have to pay to make Prezi presentations private. Good points, yes. So if you want to take an existing PowerPoint slide deck and kind of manipulate it and play with it and make it a Prezi presentation, you can do so. And um, more advanced features, if you want to make it private to you and only other particular people, you, you can pay for those extra features. So it's good to know about. One thing I would mention with this as well, if you're going to look into Prezi, it is a great program, it is fun. Uh, most people tend to like it a lot aware of it though is that if you are creating presentations that are projected onto a large screen with a lot of different uh, swirly animations between things, uh, some audience members may find that a little disconcerting. So be careful about how much animation you put in there, but simple things like panning between one thing or the next is typically fine. Just be careful about uh, too much motion in your presentations. Another thing I want to mention about presenting PowerPoint is available through Office 365 and as a mobile app for everyone here on campus for free. Well, for free, obviously it comes through tuition dollars, et cetera, and we make it available to everyone across campus, to make sure that we're all using the same tools. But with the mobile presentation app, you can actually, with mobile PowerPoint, you can actually present on the go. So if I have my tablet or my laptop, I'm able to open and edit my presentations, but then I'm also able to get access to those basic presentation features I would have on a desktop. This is a fairly new feature to the PowerPoint mobile application. So you'll see here, I have a screenshot that was taken from a tablet. Here I have the slide I'm currently on, 
as well as the next slide. So I can get a feel for how my presentation is going to go. And I actually have all of my slide notes. This is one thing that wasn't available in PowerPoint mobile app previously. I would simply just see the current slide I'm on. But now I actually have access to my notes too. So if I wanted to, I could take my iPad, and if there is a, a cable that I can connect to it, an HDMI cable, or if there's an Apple TV available to me in the room, I could then present it and project it up on the screen, still be able to walk around the class, and get access to all of my slides and all of the slide notes. So it can be really useful if you just have a tablet or a phone and you still want access to all those features of PowerPoint. They are, in fact, available from the mobile app. So again, uh, mobile device to create and present. One nice thing about the PowerPoint app itself, unlike other apps which will, be, which will allow you to present from your PowerPoint slides, the PowerPoint mobile app itself does keep all of the animations, special fonts, graphics uh, in your in your presentation as well. Some others will uh, strip out animations or strip out videos or things that you've embedded into them. And as I mentioned, keeping those slide notes there, if you use slide notes when you're presenting, very nice to have those. Usually you'd be tied to a lectern, but now you can actually keep your uh, notebook with you while you're walking around the class. Again, uh, mobile apps available on the app stores if you're looking at doing PowerPoint while actually kind of up and around. Other options, uh, Google Docs, if you use Google Docs a lot, they do allow you to create uh, simple slide presentations, and they do have the ability to present with those as well. And Evernote, as I mentioned, now has a new presentation mode, though it is one of its premium features, which you have to pay for. But then you can actually present your uh, simple notes. You can tap the screen and actually move your finger around and highlight things uh, right then and there that you're presenting, which is kind of fun. Any questions on any of those so far? No, all right. Well, I wanted to get into a few last apps, which you may find very useful. Uh, Zotero is a annotation collection, a bibliography creation tool. It is available on the web if you just log in zotero.org or for download if you want to install it on your computer. You'll notice here a project uh, we actually started here at Faculty Development to do a little research on LMS use, so uh, why people are using Blackboard here on campus and other things. And here we've saved a number of references. So these are different uh, resources that we found, different journal articles, which we uh, may find useful for our own research here. You'll notice that it has in the title, the authors, abstract, this is a system for actually capturing all that information from the web and quickly making it available to yourself in one nice list, either on your PC or your Mac or um, from the web interface too. And you can actually uh, collaborate on it as well. So here we have our group for everyone who is working on this project here in faculty development. So very useful for people who are trying to keep these sessions in one place and be able to access it from anywhere. Uh, I love this program so much. You can also create um, bibliographies just by copying and pasting. So if I wanted to, I could actually highlight multiple of these articles, go up to edit and click create bibliography, and then paste it into Word, and then I've automatically got my bibliography created for me in the format I want. Very useful. I believe it works with um, Chicago, oh, APA, like two or three of the biggest, most well-known citation formats. So highly useful. Again, compiling references for research papers, whether that's for your own research or for your students if they're working on research as well. Uh, Beheshte says Mendeley is also another great bibliography tool. Ah, good to know. Yes, excellent. Always good to have multiple ones people can compare. Uh, but use Zotero too. Both are great. Awesome. And uh, one of the last tools I want to talk about is Rabbit. This may be something that you might not use often, but it's always good to kind of have on hand whenever you'd like it. This is a platform for sharing uh, web content amongst a few collaborators. You're actually able to share anything on uh, the web on any website that you want. 
but there are also plugins for uh, viewing videos together. So if you have a video you want to share with a few other people, if it's on Netflix or if it's on uh, Hulu or YouTube, you can actually get everyone in the same room and watching the same video at the same time. Very useful. But for instance, you can also demonstrate using something on the web. So I can come in here with my collaborators and I can open up a YouTube video and I could share that, or I could go to Google Scholar and show them how to find particular references. And if I wanted to, I could then uh, give someone else the ability to demonstrate something as well on the web. Kind of fun, useful. It is limited up to only 15 people though. So only 15 people can actually project their own uh, video chat. Otherwise, it's open for any number of collaborators. Again, useful for kind of brainstorming group collaboration sessions, as long as you're dealing with content on the web. If you did have a fully online class, though, if it was relatively small, you could show a particular video clip to the class if you found something on YouTube. It's a good way to get everyone uh, viewing the same thing at the same time. Kind of fun, kind of cool. Something I've used um, recently watching the uh, national conventions, national party conventions with some friends. But I recommend it for uh, classroom use as well. All right. So I know I've covered a ton of stuff very quickly today. But I wanted to ask everyone, let me go ahead and give you all whiteboard privileges again. Uh, go ahead and add, or just uh, type in the text chat, what were your favorite tools? What things do you think you'd use? And I'll go ahead and add a couple of my own. So Evernote and Dropbox are some of my favorites. Zotero. Office 365 for collaboration, yes. Yeah, that's going to be a really big thing. And we hope to highlight a little bit more of this uh, here at NIU uh, upcoming. We'll cover a few more of the things that you can do with Office 365 in future workshops. Rabbit, Evernote, Audacity, awesome. I'm glad, glad some of these uh, strike people as useful. Because these are some of the things that I or my colleagues here or others uh, I've met at conferences use and recommend. All right, I know we're running up against the hour. Photo, ah, photo manipulation, yes. Any last questions before we leave for today? If there are no last questions, then again, uh, my name is Peter Gowen. I'm here and I'm available to you uh, anytime during the day, answer any of your questions about technology in the classroom. Love to be able to collaborate on any of this stuff with anyone. If you have any Blackboard questions, feel free to shoot them to me. I'm always happy to answer them. And you all are very welcome. Yes, thank you for joining me here today.